I'm finally able to get back around to this. Recently, I just so happened to be looking through the categories that's in Fate, and there's a lot of them to go through. We got Yokai, we got Valkyries, we got Deities, we got Demigods. But one thing that always remains constant is that you never know what they're gonna do with the character until you get it. Concepts like immortality may or may not be recognized the way it's supposed to based on their position in the story. So we're gonna speak a little to that. We're gonna go through 13 servants that have had their immortality recognized in verse in some shape or form. How they got them exactly and then what were they given in verse to sort of match up with that. So the very obvious first choice, we got my guy Achilles. As you guys know, Achilles initially was only a mortal man. He's the son of a sea nymph, that being Thetis, and then his father was Peleus, who was the king of Thia, and he was part of the Argonauts. So his mother already had divinity in her. So that part was taken care of. But since she made it with his father, Achilles ended up turning out mortal anyway. And this had her in a rut. She couldn't stand the idea that she would eventually outlive her own child. So she said, well, I'm not gonna have my son out here looking like some type of bozo. I gotta make him more like an actual deity. So she took Achilles to the supernatural river of sticks located in the underworld, or if we're going by the other version and the one that's used by fate, she gave him ambrosia and dipped him in a pool of fire. And anybody that's dipped into it will receive said immortality. So she grabs Achilles by the ankle and that's how that part of his lore came about, Achilles heel. She grabbed him by the ankle, dipped him into the fire, and from that point on, he was invincible in every location except his heel. And of course, you guys know how that turned out. Trojan War, they were getting help from the gods. Paris got a blessing, ended up shooting him in the heel. For his fake counterpart, what he has received is a skill called Amaranth of the Brave. And what this does is it allows him to negate any attack whatsoever unless it comes from something that's divine unless you have a divinity in your kit or you hit him with a divine construct you cannot harm him the only other exception is being an ally which allows you to bypass this so just like in his past he's invincible everywhere but is healed and naturally this makes him very difficult for anybody to fight against and nigh impossible for most people you got Siegfried another one of my favorites at first Siegfried was just a human he was good at combat he was good at commanding but it didn't go any further than that until he went to hunt down the dwarven treasure and what he finds is that this treasure is guarded by the legendary dragon Fafnir. He beats the dragon with the help of his Balmung and when he did this he ended up bathing in his blood and the blood was mystic so it made him invulnerable the thing about that is the blood hit him everywhere except where a leaf fell on his back so in that regard he's a lot like achilles he's invincible everywhere except one location but he does have different conditions and this comes out in his phantasm the armor of fafnir where unless you have at least an a rank he will negate any physical or magical attack that's b rank or lower thanks to his armor Tons of people sleep on my guy Siegfried because of the way that he was handled in the story. They just don't know he's running through a lot of servants. So yeah, the spot where the leaf was, that's his only opening. This is located directly on his back and he does have a curse where he has to leave that spot open. It has to be exposed. That's the main drawback. For our third person, we have Merlin. And truth be told, Merlin is again, another one of those people that never passed away. What happened to him was more in line with the personal affair. As I mentioned in the other video, he did have some hookups with Vivian, the lady of the lake. And when he started going around and messing with other women, it really infuriated her. The bad part about this is, by this point, he had already taught her magecraft. So she basically used his own teachings against him and chased him all the way into Avalon, where she locked him in the tower and he was stuck to remain there forever. So even now, and this is his main phantasm, he's still in that very tower. A great bulk of the story revolves around it. Honestly, we shouldn't even be able to have Merlin, but he's so broken that the story recognizes his death 
because he has a way around it. And this comes out as his independent manifestation. Cutting straight to the chase, it allows him to make an avatar from that tower so he doesn't have to leave it. And he keeps everything he has even though it's just an avatar. So despite him still being stuck in Avalon, it's like he's not even there. Normally being at his rank in this skill, you would have to be a beast. Goetia also has this skill for example, but we all know that he's full of surprises. Like him outright running to Babylonia while the world was ending, he could bypass the laws of him being stuck there even after his avatar was destroyed. For our next person, we have Skyhawk. Now Skyhawk is an interesting one because she received a ridiculous increase from her original lore going over into fate. She didn't have a huge part in the lore. She was no more than that person that taught Ku Cullen or Ku's master. Now, on top of her advanced rune knowledge and her prowess with the spear, she has also fought her way up to immortality. Thanks to her slaying a countless amount of entities in the land of shadows, including gods, the throne started to look at her as being halfway to being a divine spirit. And with that came the inability to die by normal standards. The reason we get her is because the version that we summon, her land of shadows has been dislocated from time. So she was allowed to die. In fate, you still get a hint of this with her noble phantasm, Gate of Sky, which outright kills anything that gets sucked into it if you can resist it. And if you can, at the very least, it will fatally wound you. Not only does it not kill Skyhawk because of her immortality, but she can also use it to transport herself. Literally out here dimensional hopping at will. That's actually cheating. Next up, we got Kets. Now, Kets is a very interesting subject. She's based on the god of the same name in Aztec myth, well, the thing about this god is that they were immortal as well. And there are different perceptions to immortality in myth. Sometimes it's just you live forever. You can still die by being slain or poisoned, but you won't die for any health reasons or anything like that. It would have to be some type of intervention. That was the case with Kets. I've said it before, Kets is absolutely ridiculous. And that's before you get to her counterpart, Kukulkin. What we saw in Babylonia was just a hint of how strong she actually is. Likewise, the way that she shows up in the story, she is extremely powerful defensively. As a matter of fact, she took absolutely nobody serious but Tiamat, somebody literally capable of destroying the world, and even then she still survived to the very end. Kets never died in that chapter. She left when we left, but more than her just being based on a god, she's based on a serpent primordial. She was a chief god, which far surpasses any deity of normal standing. Over in Fate, we see a part of this in her Sunstone Phantasm, which internalizes that authority from her past offensively and defensively. Using this under the worst circumstances, she would be one of the hardest servants to get rid of. Don't let her pull this out. And the craziest part about all of this is that she's actually nerfed multiple times one via her summoning and then also she gave up half her divinity before she even used the move next up we got canis now i will say that her immortality comes out still accurate to her lore but it's not in the way that you think originally canis wasn't immortal but she did have the favor of poseidon something they take note of in the story you know in myth poseidon found her took her against her will and then after that he granted her a wish and that wish was for her to be turned into a man so she could forego the trauma so he changed her sex completely the reason why it's accurate is because what fate takes note of is that she had the favor of poseidon and in doing so inverse she also has this same favor she she literally has a skill called favor of the sea god which makes her immortal anytime that she's out at open waters doesn't matter how you get there we've seen her do things like completely eat sherlock's phantasm and he couldn't help but just be confused and that's not the only thing she was also granted his trident it's called poseidon's blessing something that's intertwined with her sea god skill they bounce off each other which gives her buffs both offensively and defensively she can't even use the trident at its full power because it would destroy her body it would destroy her core so just using some of poseidon's defensive buffs not even all of it made her immortal 
And to tack on to that, she was granted his Sea God armor, both of which just further her conceptual defense. She has automatic rejuvenation. She's had her body completely dismembered and survived that. She fell into the Great Pit, which is technically a void, survived that, and she tanked lightning bolts from Zeus. So as far as her immortality goes, even if it's just limited, it's the real deal. Next up, we got King Arthur, Artoria, and Goddess Rongo. Now, for the versions of King Arthur, that we get in the story it's understood that they did die because that's the only way we would be able to get them as a servant but in his actual myth there's times where it's been stated otherwise where just like merlin he's still alive and he's in his slumber in a cave waiting on the day that britain needs him the most and this is something that you can see translated in lore avalon in and of itself is a limited form of immortality while ortoria is using this you can't harm her at all. I'd even go as far to say that not only is this one of the strongest armaments in the verse, but it's one of the strongest armaments in fiction. It's literally 6D conceptual defense, and the only chances that you really have against it is hitting her in between or taking it from her. You may get away with the conceptual attack if it's stronger than, say, something like Muramasa's blade. Absolutely ridiculous on all fronts. Likewise, you have the story of the Lion King, who in FGO ended up turning into a divine spirit when she took up the Rongo Minion at the time of her supposed death. This left her alive for 1500 years and she was fated to live until the end of the world aka being immortal so long as she had rongo then we got heracles another one that you should be well familiar with heracles initially was only a demigod his mother being alcmene and his father being zeus but when he was brought to hera he gained some of her supernatural powers so his powers extended a bit more than your normal demigod which would later lead him into being the greatest hero of all time. He completed the 12 labors as a punishment to himself when Hera took control of him and made him take the lives of his own children. Definitely a real one for that. So he pulled these things off when nobody else could and in turn he was granted immortality and deified among the other gods at Olympus beyond his death. He is without a doubt the most accurate when it comes to immortality on this list. He's one of the first ones. On this side he's been given his god hand where just like in lore you have to get rid of him 12 times in order to actually take him down like Siegfried it can't be anything less than an A rank and under normal circumstances you also can't use the same thing over again so what you would need is 12 different things or you could take the route of having something strong enough to take multiple lives we know that you can take more lives than one with things like Artemis's cannon, Rongo Miniot, anything that has that level of power in its reserves can be counted towards that 12. Caliburn, as we saw in the Fate Route, Excalibur, the Phantasm of Suitor, he's truly one of a kind. And that's not just Fate, that's pretty much any fiction dealing with Heracles or Hercules, they're always busted as they should be. By the way, I also need to mention that if you do happen to get through his god hand, if another phantasm is in that same realm, he will gain resistance to the second one if you hit him with the first. So though it might not be the same, his defense just gets higher. The next person that we gotta get into is Ozymandias, AKA Ramses II. Now Ozzy's existence is another one that's been exaggerated from his original. He was an actual figure in history, but he also has poetic counterparts and fate kind of plays into that in the verse he's been recognized as the sun and the incarnation of the sun god Ra. and by extension he's gained access to many divine blessings and his very own immortality you have his direct skill protection of the sun god which pretty much allows Ra to curve anything that's not extremely powerful. You'd have to be at a certain level to even deal with Ozzy. And then you have his temple, his pyramid phantasm, the Ramuseum, where as long as Ozzy is inside this temple, he cannot be killed. So you would have to take down the defenses of the temple first to truly get rid of him. We've seen this in situations like King Hassan, who was literally a grand servant at the time, literally over him in name cut Ozzy's entire head off and he still couldn't kill him. Ozzy was just shocked that he was able to do it and then he just put his head right back on. What in the Looney Tunes is this? Then you got 
Come on, man. You got my girl, Prey Lottie, and her counterpart servant form as well. Prey Lottie was said to have delved into black magic back in her lifetime, and through this in fate, she has been granted the same magecraft by having Prelati's spellbook. This gives her access to greater magecraft, which is already higher than what the mages from the Age of Man can produce. It essentially goes into the outer gods and the aliens of the verse, and it's also on par with ritual magic. The wild part about that is, she didn't even need the book. Even without the book, with her knowledge Knowledge alone, she was able to find a way to hop bodies for several years. She's been through at least 30 bodies, and she continues to do this through her own method that has still yet to be revealed. And that's without using her servant form, by the way. Then, of course, you can't forget angry incarnate Ashwatthama. Now, Ashwatthama might not get as much press as Arjuna or Karna, but he is, in fact, one of the greatest warriors in his myth, the Mahabharata, boasting a rank higher than the both of them. He also had a form of immortality, but again, it wasn't through normal methods. What happened to him was he was in a situation where his father, Drona, was assassinated and the Pandavas had did this during a time of peace and this is where all his rage and his character comes from. He goes out during the night to return the favor and ambush majority of their camp taking down as many people as he possibly could. It's actually stated that he took down thousands of people and for that he ended up being cursed with immortality. It was supposed to be a bad thing. He was cursed to wander the world forever at his worst and never perish. It was a curse put onto him by Krishna, one of the three primordials in Hindu. This same thing happened to him in fate as well. Originally, he didn't have the curse on him, but the curse of Krishna was placed onto his lost belt counterpart by Arjuna Altar. And Arjuna basically used it in the same way that it was supposed to be in his myth, where no matter what type of damage he took, he would always regenerate. But Arjuna used this to torture him over and over again until he did his bidding. We've seen him use this to regenerate from Karna's best phantasm, Vasavi Shakti. We've seen him fight Karna for thousands of matches, going all out in a different dimension and come out unbothered. You have Rama mentioned, who is also an incredible warrior if he tore Ashwatthama to shreds, he still would be able to regenerate. And countless people throughout the story saying that he might as well be the classic immortal. Then we got Doman, your favorite conspirator. Just like many characters, Sasaki for instance, Doman has a fake counterpart that plays into the obscurity in his background. The year that he was born and the year that he passed away are unknown, which leaves the door open for a lot of flexibility. Case in point, what we see from him in fate. Considering that he has no actual death, fate has intertwined this with his prior dabbling with the occult. They gave him the ability to countlessly reincarnate himself through his life continuation ritual. In doing so, we see him attach multiple shikigami or ghosts to his saint graph. So no matter how many times you take him down, you'll only take down the shikigami and it will deter you from reaching the main body. This is his form of immortality. And while we're at it, we gotta get my boy Karna in there. We did put Siegfried in there and this one is no different. In his background, while Karna wasn't actually immortal, he does have access to something that gave him practical immortality. This being his armor and his earrings that he got from his father, the sun god Surya. And in fate, you can tell they did a really good job with this because he has the exact same thing despite the fact of him being nerfed. In myth, this set was supposed to make him impervious to any attack. It was actually melted into his body. Now that he has this over in fate, any attack while he's wearing this, he'll only feel 10% of it. So he gets to curve 90% of an attack while he's wearing this armor. The drawback is, of course, having Karna in general. He's a huge mana drainer. Not everybody can handle that. And then the other half is by law of his lore, he actually gave up this fantastic to get his Vasavi Shakti, which is the strongest weapon in his kit. So for him, depending on the situation, it's either one or the other. For our honorable mention, we got King Hassan. Now I'm sure a lot of the goofies couldn't wait to flock to the video to tell me, not King Hassan, King Hassan wasn't immortal. You're right. 
He was an immortal, but I'm not talking about King Hassan. The reason I bring King Hassan into this is because of his role as Zia Sudra. And Zia Sudra was in fact said to be immortal. And I think this is important because it plays a lot into the idea that Hassan is borderline unkillable. If you look at the way that he portrays himself in the story, the way that he portrays himself as King Hassan, an angel of death, and Zia Sudra, and he has such a familiar background with the deceased that it would take a lot to bring him to that point. Most servants end up vanishing by the end of the war or they get taken out by some other servant. Hassan literally just disappears. It's not a matter of, oh, he was defeated. The man literally just vanishes every time, no matter what he does. Even when he gave up his grand title, they just stopped showing him in the chapter. He was like, all right, I done did what I had to do. I'm out. And to double down on that fact, I feel like there's a lot of things that we still don't know about Hassan. I feel like he's like Merlin, where he just shows us what he needs to at that time. Babylonia, for instance, you had the time where Ishtar tried to charge him in his Zia Sudra form, and she literally went right through him, phased right through his body. There is nothing in Hassan's kit, nothing in his material that says that he can do that. And yet this man is displacing attacks at will, further playing into that immortal field. I gotta give it to him. That's just some of the people that's immortal to give you guys something to hold on to, get the gears turning. I do feel like now that I've done this, it's only right that we get into all the people that should be immortal and are actually not. So we may have to do that as well. We'll see how it goes.